Okay. Uh, let's start with my talk. Uh, thank you very much for uh, showing up in these uh, huge numbers for uh, uh, the topic caching in Spring. Um, Short introduction to myself. My name is Michael Plöd. I work for a consulting company in InnoQ. Have always been busy in all things Spring, and recently, uh, throughout the last couple of years, I actually spent quite a bit of time uh, working on caching solutions, integrating them to some applications. And I thought that might be a good idea to include that uh, those lessons learned into a, a short talk on caching in Spring. Um, what are we going to talk about in these 50 minutes that we're going to spend together? Um, first of all, um, basically this talk has two parts. One part is, I would say, a rather general um, set of best practices, ideas, intro introductions to caching. So if you're not going to use caching in Spring, I think you might benefit from quite a bit of the things that I'm going to talk there. And we will talk, uh, take this content then and see how we can add caching in Spring. We will talk about Spring's cache abstraction. We will talk about Jcache. But please be aware that this, is, uh, this talk is not about some NoSQL uh, Spring data related stuff. So this talk is going to be about the cache abstractions in Spring. And we're not going to talk about latency discussions, synchronization discussions, what's the best caching product in the market, uh, caching in JPA, Hibernate. That's not going to be a part of this talk. So um, if we start off with caching in applications, um, we see and we Google for caching Java applications. We will be confronted with a plethora of things. Local caching, data grids, document databases, uh, JPA, second level cache, hybrid caches, and whatnot. Um, what I think uh, a lot of these blogs on caching um, are mixing up a little bit is um, the non-functional requirements of applications. Uh, because a lot of these, I would say, uh, no SQL, in-memory database, in-memory caches, uh, a lot of these articles, they mostly focus on or describe very extreme use cases, such as, well, Twitter has been doing stuff with memcached for ages. That's true. But I would say that the usual business application that most of us are I think we're going to be confronted with has totally different non-functional requirements in terms of scalability and so on in terms of caching. So that is just a disclaimer. So if you want to get into the topic, I would recommend you to learn your non-functional requirements. What about latencies? What about um, eventual consistency? Uh, the amount of actual data, the requirements on scalability and so on. And when we want to introduce something like caching into an application, we might have a couple of questions that arise. For instance, uh, what's the impact on my infrastructure? Which cache implementation should I use? Should I write my own cache? We'll get to, uh, to that a little bit later. How about data consistency? Uh, where in the application shall I cache? Uh, which data should I cache? Or how, how do I introduce caching? And how can I handle caching with Spring? And we will go through all of these, um, I would say, um, questions uh, within the talk. Um, so the first question that might arise is, where should I actually cache data? And the first thing that I, I would say is that you should know your topology. So first, first of all, there is uh, a structure of applications. So there's different levels in applications where you can cache. For instance, on an HTTP level with cache headers, on uh, some REST resources, uh, on the database level, uh, every bigger database has their cache included. You can cache on the data provider, maybe on read operations on business services, but also um, in terms of where you store your data in the cache. So I would say, what we have here is the typical uh, Google Guava EH cache uh, whatnot use case. So we have an, a JVM with some application inside. It has some layers that are not of a big of interest uh, for us in this talk. And then within the JVM, we have some part of the heap space allocated to a cache. And 
if your application is fine with running in this setting, I envy you. That's the perfect setting. Low latency, direct in-memory, no clustering, nothing. So that's a heaven. Uh, unfortunately, or what's, let's say unfortunately, good for the Spring team because they have interesting solutions, uh, usually we run in distributed clustered applications. So uh, if we spread this scenario out to several nodes or several instances running, we can still run fair enough in this kind of architecture. Um, why do I say uh, when we are able to? This relies heavily on the non-functional requirements that you have. So there may be data where you can live with some, well, false um, data being delivered, for instance, to a user interface. Why? Let's estimate, I'm, for, I'm based in Nuremberg, Germany, and I sign up to, to this website, I, I do something on it, and each of these cache nodes over there has me as a customer in its heap. So I live in Nuremberg. So I travel to Barcelona and say, hey, that's a nice city, I'm going to move there. So I call up the call center, they change my address, and on the node down there on the right side, my address gets changed to Barcelona in Spain. But the other nodes still have me in memory with me living and residing in Nuremberg. Now, is that a problem? The first answer might be, of course, that's wrong, true. But if it's a problem, is a question of non-functional requirements on the application. Maybe we can live with a timeout, for instance, every 15 minutes we evict the data set from the cache and reload it again, so we might be fine. Um, so it's not so easy to say, hmm, uh, this is right or wrong. Um, and that's the question about data consistency. Um, there are caching solutions out there, quite a few actually, that sync over the network, where the cache nodes know each other, and usually they sync through multicast, UDP kind of protocols, and these cache nodes are able to talk together. For instance, EH Cache can do that, InfiniSpan from JBoss can do that, uh, Hazelcast, uh, whatnot. Um, they, they can talk together. And there are, um, I would say, two major, but not too exclusive, ways of dealing. One is invalidation, and the other one is replication. And this is something you should really know, because um, I would say the easy part is placing the spring annotations, like uh, cacheable or whatnot, on your code. But the, the hard part is, especially when you work with cache evict, cache put, and, not, and whatnot, that you know how the cache is acting in the cluster. And so let's dive a little bit deeper into these, um, these uh, kind of uh, synchronization mechanisms. My um, best practice is actually to avoid real replication wherever possible. Why? Let's take a look first at invalidating caches. There are two strategies to invalidate data in a cache. The first one is um, that we add a customer, for instance, uh, with the ID number one uh, to each of the caches. So we have a cache put on each of the nodes, and suddenly we go ahead and change uh, one of these entries in the cache. What's going to happen is that this cache is then going to send a message over the network that invalidates all the other data. Basically, we say, hey, I changed that data. Uh, please throw your stuff away. It's probably stale. The next strategy for invalidation uh, that is something you uh, see, for instance, in InfiniSpan, is uh, that one piece of data is only allowed on one node in the cache. So this, I would say, is a perfectly suitable scenario if you work heavily with sticky sessions and, and store user-centric data in the cache. So you could work with that. It should probably do, do its job. But if you require the data on any other node, you might run into trouble. Um, and now we get to replication. Why did I say avoid real replication wherever possible? The reason is it replicates the complete data all the time. It replicates cache puts when we, when we add an entry, but also updates, which is basically also a cache put, 
and we generate a lot of network traffic and a lot of uh, overhead with uh, synchronizing the data in the cache. Another issue with this kind of scenario is, and also with the invalidation number one scenario where we can possibly have the customer with the ID one on every node, that um, here every node has potentially every piece of data which consumes heap memory. So basically, we're kind of limited on the heap. And, well, is Big Heap a solution for that? Huh, let's do a, 20, uh, a 32 gigabyte uh, JVM, no problem. Let's have the application at two gigabytes, the cache at 30 gigabytes. Has everybody ever operated a 32 gigabyte uh, sized JVM? Lucky you. <laughs> That's no fun. Why? Because uh, it has a heavy impact on our infrastructure. And I would actually avoid big heaps just for the sake of caching. Because if we have a huge heap, we're going to have issues with uh, major GCs. So um, we, we run into the problem that um, the, the JVM might halt. So if you have a, let's say, big, I'm allowed to say that at a Spring conference, dinosaur application server that uses, for instance, some kind of a node manager or something, and suddenly one node with 32 gigs of heap is running into a garbage collection, we're running at the risk of the node manager saying, this node doesn't respond anymore, I'll kick it out of the cache. And the sysadmin does have to re-add re it, so that's no solution. So our small, he uh, small cache is a solution. Okay, let's limit our cache size. Let's be very conservative. We don't want to uh, consume a lot of memory uh, in the JVM. Let's limit each cache bucket to 100 entries. That is a horrible idea. Why? Because um, what you have is, for instance, I have this, this bottle here. That's my cache size. And I start pouring water into the bottle. When I'm here, what is going to happen? Water has to flow out in order for new water to come into the bottle. And that is exactly what is going to happen with a cache that is too small. Um, we have a lot of eviction. So basically, we have a, a, a picture like, uh, like this, that each time we add something, we have to remove it. And we can't have hot data in this kind of cache. What is hot data? Hot data is data that gets a lot of hits in the cache. A hit is a get to the cache that actually returns a result from the cache. And that is exactly the scenario that we want. A cache miss is a lost access, is lost latency, basically, on the network. We don't want that. And the small cache is especially critical for caches that replicate the data. I've seen an online banking system a couple of years ago uh, that uh, had, that was very conservative in terms of cache sizes, and was using a replicating cache. And basically, uh, because of the cache sizes being too small, the system crashed on the network overhead of the replication. What happens? We have a cache evict, something new is getting in the cache, and it suddenly uh, replicates. So the system was replicating itself literally to death. Disabling the cache saved the application in production. So that is kind of an irony, isn't it? So uh, small caches are a bad idea. Uh, but there is actually, uh, in recent years, an, a very nice new alternative to cache topologies um, called distributed caches. So you might ask, where do I take these names from? Uh, invalidation, replication, distribution. Actually, I, I was influenced by, by the wordings in uh, Red Hat's InfiniSpan product. I think they have a very nice definition in their documentation. And I think I, I, that definition suited my experiences in that matter. So I, I, took, oh, I took their namings. Um, and the distribution is very good uh, for big amounts of data. Because what we do there is we take 
the cache out of the application. But that's an optional step. We can still work with the distribution method, but have the cache inside the application. But usually, you would start cache nodes outside of the application and dedicated caching service. Um, there's also a, um, let's say, construct called near cache, but um, going into that would require me to have another session uh, today, uh, which is not the case. But um, so I'll leave that out where you combine cache nodes with uh, caches in the JVM. Um, but the nice thing about the distributed cache is that we can easily add new instances to the cache without having to uh, deploy new instances of the application. So, um, and there is also a very interesting way that uh, the data gets distributed in this cache. Let's take a look at that. So we have one cache node running, and we add four customers to it. Uh, 23, 30, 27, 32. And the application is running fine. But we say, well, we want another cache node because we want to have more potential. So we start up another cache node. And what is happening usually in these distributed caches is they replicate, they automatically detect the cache node and they replicate the data. In addition to that, these kinds of products usually also create backups. You can configure that to a certain backup code. Um, so if cache node one crashes, we still have no data loss. We still have cache node two up and running with all of the data. So far, we don't have any advantage in terms of amount of data and memory being used. That's going to be interesting when we add more cache nodes. For instance, a third cache node or a fourth cache node. So you see the data gets equally replicated in the caching cluster and uh, it gets back up. So if we crash node number four, uh, we're losing backup of 30 and we're losing customer 32, but customer 32 has been backed up in node number two, so no loss of data on this side. Um, so that's very interesting. So basically, a distributed cache leads to smaller heaps, more capacity, and it's very easy to scale. Uh, a very prominent product that had a lot of traction recently is Hazelcast, for instance. That's a typical Hazelcast use case. But for instance, also InfiniSpan is able to work in a mode that is uh, very similar to this. So the next question is, which data should I cache? Um, well, usually, and that is also non-functional requirements, make sure that the data you cache is suitable. Usually, we want to have read-mostly data, so data that gets read often and written not so often. And if you urgently must cache write-intensive data, that might be the case. There are fair use cases for this scenario. I think um, the distributed cache is really playing out its strengths. Replication will add a lot of overhead in our network, uh, so not the best idea. Uh, invalidation will make our cache ineffective because it's always shooting away the data on the other nodes. So not the best idea. So the distribution mode uh, reduces the amount of network traffic because we just replicate the data to one another node in terms of the backup. And we can do these backups asynchronously, uh, for instance. And we can still handle a lot of uh, write operations. Um, Another question is, um, which cache shall I use? Mm. Let's take a look, for instance, at the documentation of the Spring framework when you say, huh, I want to use the cache abstraction in Spring. And well, he's 20 minutes into his talk and still isn't talking about the cache abstraction. But I read the documentation. There's Google Guava, there's EH cache support, uh, Gemfire, and, and whatnot. Uh, so it's kind of hard to choose a suitable implementation. Um, the, the most important rule is only use existing cache implementations. Never write your own cache implementation, ever. This isn't something I would even consider in a project, or it's something that, that should actually be a part of um, three sentences in a meeting. Um, 
Well, of course, you might think, ah, that can't be too hard. That's a nice uh, challenge for the weekend. Uh, come on, synchronizing a map and distributing it over a network can't be that hard. This is very hard. And uh, the likelihood that uh, you will fail with that uh, is, I would say, measurable. Um, so, and basically, there are so many different implementations out there. Uh, I would say there's something for every taste that you ever want. Um, so I just named a couple of them here. I think I could add 50 more slides with cache implementations. Um, there is very, very small lightweight implementations like the Google Guava stuff. I would also call EH cache very easy to adapt, very easy to use. Then there is like some bigger uh, shots in the industry like um, Terracotta, Coherence, Gemfire, or even, let's say, very enterprisey stuff like WebSphere's Extreme Scale, Oracle 12C in memory database, and whatnot. So I think uh, every project, or 99.99% of the projects that we usually do, uh, should find a suitable implementation. Um, and there is really no reason to write your own cache, except for studying latency, replication stuff, and so on. But please study a long time before putting this into production. So, so the next thing is, how do I introduce caching to my application? The first thing is, um, please mind the security gap. Uh, I think a lot of the projects that I've seen out there took a lot, a great deal of care about securing their databases, their access to their SAP systems, their ERP systems, and whatnot. Big security, lots of encryption, um, authentication, whatnot. But what happens with the data that gets cached in there? Mm. That is rarely the case. Um, so we load. Uh, data from a CRM application, which is secured. We load data from a relational database, which gets secured. And then suddenly we go ahead and put that into some sort of map in the cache where everybody who's able to do a heap dump can extract the data from. I've seen that so many times, so please consider that and think about adding some layer of security to the cache, especially if you work with very sensitive data one of the question marks you should put in your evaluation for a good caching product, how about security? Is the cache encrypted? Do we have encry encrypted connections to the cache? Maybe there is just security available and, and stuff like that. Uh, please be aware of that, uh, that uh, you um, have some sort of security when reading data from the cache. I've seen that too often that there's just some Google Guava or EH cache and everybody's dumping data in there. It gets replicated across the network and nobody cared about security. That shouldn't be the case. So, well, basically, some might be a little bit unhappy right now because I'm 40 slides in and I haven't mentioned Spring's cache abstraction except for announcing that I would talk about Spring's cache abstraction. Um, this is going to happen now, because when adding um, the, uh, uh, when introducing caching, you should abstract your cache provider. Mm. Why that? Let's take a look at some, some example code right there. We have a code that retrieves some account information from some sort of a backend. And if we all are honest and look at that code, um, we all take some time to see what is actually happening in this piece of code. Because there is a lot of stuff going on there. And the, um, let's say, the, the only interesting part is the stuff over there where we execute some business logic and take the data out of some backend system of a database, Spring Data Repository, or whatnot. So the next thing is this code has been written against the EH cache API. So we, we uh, 
access some cache from the cache manager from EH Cache. Uh, we see if there is an entry in the cache. Um, if, if, the, if it's not, we, we retrieve the data from the backend system. Uh, we put the new entry to the cache. Or otherwise, we just return the value from the cache. So now, guess you want to switch from EH Cache to Hazelcast. You would have to change all these lines of codes. So of course, you can say, huh, We've done our due diligence. We chose our cache provider wisely, which is very good. Um, and we're, we're stuck with EH cache, and that's fine for us. Good for you. But uh, now assume you're, for instance, running in a web sphere world where you want to work with the distributed objects feature of web sphere. Um, you can't unit test the code when you work with this kind of replicating cache, because this infrastructure is tied to the container, and you would have to deploy the application to your container. So for a unit test, we would want to use um, Google Guava Cache or just some concurrent hash map. So you're stuck. Do you want to have if, else? No. Uh, nobody would want that. So basically, AH Cache is very tightly coupled to your code. And the next thing is this piece of code has no right to be in this, in, in, this, uh, in this method, because it says retrieve account. It doesn't say check if, if the account is in the cache, retrieve it, and if not, retrieve it from a backend, then put it back to the cache. That would be a more honest way to, to, to name this function. So um, that's also uninteresting. And that's exactly where Spring's cache abstraction comes into place. Let me go a little uh, to, the, to the other slide again first. Uh, what have we been doing in the, in, the, in the recent years? Well, I would say most of the projects either said, ah, OK, we're going to cache on the JPA Hibernate level. We will use second level caching in JPA Hibernate. Fair enough. Declarative works rather good. Uh, no problem. Or we will go ahead and write AOP interceptors on our own, add them uh, to our Spring stack, and they would handle this piece of code. But now, Spring delivers for quite some time now a cache abstraction uh, as part of the Spring core. And uh, it's very easy to use. So in, in the modern, beautiful way, as Josh used to say it, uh, we would add uh, at configuration, at enable caching. And there is also an inter interface called caching configurer where you would programmatically uh, register certain classes as a cache resolver, key generator, and so forth. I, I, I really like these interfaces like the caching configurer because they give you a hint what you should configure in order to, to have everything up and running. In the classical, or some may say old school XML namespace world, we would use cache annotation driven and define a cache manager. And I think what is very nice about this piece of XML, it shows you that the infrastructure of the caching gets extracted. So you just define the cache provider if you use EH cache, if you use InfiniSpan, if you use Guava or whatnot. Um, it's part of the configuration, not of the code. Because in the code, you just use some annotations. For instance, the cacheable annotation, which would add the customer to a cache region called customers. Um, very declarative, very nice to use. And what we see here already is if we want, for instance, in a unit test, uh, just a concurrent hash map, we just change the configuration of the Spring application context for the unit testing. And it's totally transparent for our code. So we are not tied to EH cache, Hazelcast, or whatnot uh, in our code. Um, and Spring also delivers a couple of annotations. In the first slide, you have already seen the cacheable annotation, uh, which is, I would say, the most widely used annotations. A lot of the applications that I see when I work with customers I would say mostly rely on, on at cacheable. Mm. Semantic of this annotation is it demarcates a cacheable method. That means we will read and write to the cache. 
So the semantic of at cacheable is basically the one you have seen in the, in the bad code example that I showed you. So we will look up the cache. Is there an entry with a given key in there? I will talk about keys later on. Uh, please bear with me for a minute. And um, if there is an entry, we don't call the method. We directly return the value from the cache. If there is no entry in the cache, we will call the annotated method, let it do its thing, and add the result to the cache, and then return the value. At cache evict, um, demarcates method, me methods that perform cache evictions. Um, and it basically triggers removers from the cache. So basically, if you have a delete or remove some kind of data function, you might want to uh, annotate it with add cache evict, because after the function completed successfully, the cache would get evicted by the given key. Uh, cache put um, updates the cache with the annotated method's return value. And this annotation will always execute the method. And that's the difference to cacheable. Cacheable might execute the method. Cache put will always annotate the method. So if you have methods where you say, the cache, I want to execute the method. And after executing the method, I want to make sure that the cache gets updated. That's, that's like a forced update of the cache. You might want to use a cache put. Um, caching uh, is an annotation that allows you to combine uh, cacheable, cache evict, and cache put annotations to be used on the same method. Um, it is a very powerful annotation, but as good old Yoda in Star Wars said, with great power comes great responsibility. And uh, you will, as you will see later on, there is a lot of SPL support embedded in these annotations. Um, I, I, you, my, mm, my experience is that using the uh, caching annotation usually adds up to the complexity and that uh, teams of developers stop uh, understanding what is in these methods after they, re they returned from the weekend, um, drinking beers at the bar or whatever. And then we have cache config, which is a class level annotation that allows to share cache names, uh, key generators, and so on. So my recommendation, if you use the Spring Cache Abstraction, which is awesome, um, I mostly stick to the first three annotations, and I prefer to have dedicated methods for each of the app, uh, annotations because it's more concise, better understandable, and so on. I, I'm not a fan of, uh, I would say, rocket science in, in some methods with a lot of stuff going on. I, I like precise and easy to understand code, so I think um, uh, I stick to that recommendation. Um, I've already been talking quite a bit about um, key um, cache keys. What is a cache key? Usually, a cache is, you can, is a map. That's the typical semantic of some cache. So we have a key and we have a value. And we might want to decide what is the key that we're going to access the cache with. Um, and Spring's cache abstraction has uh, a couple of defaults for that. So for instance, the first method just stores the customer number. So you would have a string of the customer number as the cache key. If you have more parameters, uh, Spring packs them into a simple key object and uses this object in a serialized manner as the cache key. And if we don't have any methods, uh, any parameters on a method, uh, simple key dot empty would be the um, default key that we're going to use. And if you use the cache configurer interface in the programmatic configuration of Spring, you will see that there is one method that you will have to implement uh, that says key generator. That's the simple key generator. New return, new simple key generator. And this indicates that you can change the strategy how you want this handling to be. For instance, we don't want to work with 
let me go back to the example, the th third default. On the get monthly report, we don't want to work with simple key.empty. We want a different semantic on no parameters, basically. So what we can do is we can write our my own key generator, which implements the interface key generator, and have the semantic. In this case, it would just be a simple key with a string empty um, as the cache key, um, and use this. And we can add the key generator basically to the configuration. In the XML space, it's just a, a parameter to the uh, cache annotation-driven XML namespace kind of thing. Um, in the programmatic configuration, it's just a bean key generator that we return. So you can totally customize this behavior if you want. Um, you can also use uh, Spring's expression language in the annotations. Um, for instance, um, we, uh, for this first method, list concerts, and we have a location, and we don't want to cache the location, use the location as the cache key, a serialized version of the location. We just want to use the ID, the primary key of the location, as the key of the cache. We can do that with a SPL expression in the annotation. The next one is, uh, for instance, um, we um, want the hash code of the location to be uh, the key. The next one is a conditional caching. We can add conditions written in the expression language of Spring uh, to decide on the cacheable annotations if some data gets cached or if some data doesn't get cached. When is that interesting? Um, let's say you have a very big amount of customers in your organization, and you know that the newest 10,000 customers tend to have a lot of calls to your call center. Imagine a system for mortgage loans. So usually somebody who is signing up for a mortgage loan because they bought a house or an apartment or a condo or something like that, um, they would usually hit up the call center with questions. But as soon as the lo loan got paid up and is in its usual repayment cycle, people just live with it and there is no big interaction. So we could have a conditional caching that only the newest 10,000 customers customers newer than, let's say, last month with a sign-up date get cached, and the others don't get cached because we just go to the back end, because it's a rare a case that uh, this happens. So we can do that. And um, on the cache put annotation, that's um, one of the later features that got added, um, we can add um, the generated ID um, as a key. So basically, uh, the key feature in cache put um, is, uh, now also, has now also access to the result in the expression language. Why is that interesting? Imagine yourself uh, working with JPA, and you have a primary key generator, at generated ID, as a JPA annotation. What is usually going to happen in term? There is no unique behavior in terms of the generated keys. Uh, sometimes the keys get generated later, sometimes they get generated right away, for instance, on a sequence. And I want to add the uh, location with the cache put on a safe operation. Now, this works also uh, with generated IDs. Um, now, let's say we have multiple caches and multiple cache managers. So we have... Uh, we are a, a diverse bunch in our development team. We like Google Guava Cache, we like Hazelcast, we like Infinispan, and uh, we want to use all of these caches. Um, how is that going to happen? Um, first of all, you can manually assign um, the, uh, oh, let me go back, uh, we can manually assign a cache manager. So we can define n, uh, n uh, cache manager beans in our Spring application context configuration. And uh, each of these beans have, it has its own ID. And we can say, okay, we, we cache the, co the concerts in Hazelcast, uh, but the bands, we want to have them in Gemfire, for instance. Or 
we can programmatically decide that with a, a cache resolver. The cache resolver is a piece of code that decides which cache gets used for which use case. And um, you can uh, write your own cache resolver. And uh, the, usually, you would uh, extend abstract uh, cache resolver for that and say, OK, if the entity name is like that, then use this cache. Uh, if the package name is like that, and you can programmatically decide um, where to cache some sort of data. Um, to be honest, um, in terms of expressiveness, mm, I rarely tend to use cache resolvers. I like to see it in the configuration. Ah, OK, this method ends up in ehcache. This ends up in a gem file, for instance. So I look at the annotation, and I automatically see where to search for the data. That's a little bit, for my taste, a little bit straightforward. But it's a feature that you should be aware of if you happen to be in the case uh, that this gets interesting. There are certainly use cases for that. And uh, you can also use your own custom annotations for caching. So as with the Spring component annotations, you, for instance, uh, can say, ah, OK, um, I have a default uh, way of caching concert data. At default, concert cacheable works like with at component, at service, and whatnot. And then there is, that's the Spring part in terms of caching. So you see, Spring's cache abstraction is very powerful. It gets you a very, very long way in terms of introducing caching to your application in a very safe way. But uh, there is now an alternative called the Jcache specification. Uh, who has already heard about Jcache? Yeah, quite a few in the room. So Jcache is an effort uh, in the Java EE community with uh, support from quite a few uh, partners in the community in order to have a, something similar like the Spring stuff uh, for the Java EE world. Mm. Unfortunately, um, the Jcash JSR team um, didn't make it into Java EE 7. So uh, it's not a part of Java EE 7. Um, and um, I would say teams that r run a exclusive Java EE only approach will have to wait until Java EE 8 comes out, until the application with Java EE support ships, and until the internal operating team ships the application server with Java EE support. But the good t uh, news is, if you combine Java EE with Spring, which is a good idea, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be here, you would have Jcache support right now. Because um, Spring um, is basically the first container mm, that supports JSR 107. So you can use all of the Jcache annotations um, in a Spring application, and it works. Um, so let's compare the annotations, the Spring and the, uh, the Jcache world. Cacheable is basically at cache result. Um, very similar, but a, a slight semantic difference between, uh, but because cache result is able to cache exceptions. Spring doesn't cache exceptions. So if some method throws an exception on a parameter, this annotation would be able to, to cache the exception. Um, cache evict is cache remove. Very similar, but also the exception case. Um, cache evict remove all equals true, which is a, just a parameter difference, uh, would be at cache remove all in uh, the jcache world. Cache put is cache put. Um, but please be aware um, uh, of a different semantic here, um, because the cache content must be annotated with cache value in the jcache world. And cache config um, uh, and cache put are identical. All you have to do in order to enable jcache um, is uh, to add the dependency uh, spring context uh, support um, to your class path, and you're ready to go with jcache. 
So that is actually um, very good news. And one last thing is if you want to disable caching for unit tests, um, you can add a property called fallback to no op cache to true in your uh, cache manager configuration. And uh, it would disable um, caching for unit tests. And there is another gem hidden in this slide. Um, it's called Composite Cache Manager. Composite Cache Manager is a cache manager that is, enables you to combine several cache managers to one thing. Also a very nice uh, feature, which I usually rarely use because I would say most of the applications are, are quite fine running uh, with uh, one implementation of caching. So basically, I'm done with my slides. Um, just a quick note uh, on an organizational kind of thing. My Twitter handle is at BitBoss. You can follow me, and I will tweet a link to the slides, um, I would say, 20 to 15 minutes after the talk, so you can download the slides. I'll be around at the conference um, today, and I would say till noon tomorrow, um, because then I have to catch my flight back. Um, I I'm happy to answer a couple of questions. And um, if you want to walk up to me at the party or at the coffee break, feel free to do so. I'm happy to help if I can. Thank you. Thank you. Some questions? Yes? yes? Uh, just a second. The microphone is coming your way so that everybody understands the question. OK, thank you. So let's say you have a white-labeled product. Uh, a what? I have? A white-labeled product. OK. So it, it has some caching. It, it, it has, for example, some customer management mm -hmm. stuff. You have a cache for mm -hmm. the customers. You have cache, uh, cacheable and cache edit. Mm -hmm. And this product is used by some other project. Mm -hmm. The project is built up on that uh, mm -hmm. product. But they want to, to, to uh, so they have another, let's say, function, mm -hmm. which, uh, which is also cache, uh, which is also using a different cache. Mm -hmm. But when the the cache in the product is evicted, this cache in the the the, the, the functions cache should be also evicted. Mm -hmm. So how can I bind those uh, caches together? And, and make them evicted? I think I would take a look. Um, to be honest, I haven't had that use case so far. Uh, but uh, my first thing that I would look at would be the composite cache manager. Because uh -huh. the, you com logically combine the two caches. First thing I would take a look at. Or you do a cache evict and address both, uh, both cache managers. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. When you have uh, several, uh, I mean, several caches, mm -hmm. how do you configure different time to lease for every cache? OK. Um, the question was uh, if I have uh, several um, caches, which means you mean cache regions, so several parts uh, in, in one caching instance several maps, how do I configure time to live, evictions, and so on. This is nothing you do with Spring. That is native configuration you have to do in the implementation of the cache. Yeah, because I've been able to do that with uh, each cache, each, mm -hmm. each cache, but with, with Redis, I haven't been able to uh, you have use Redis. Yeah. So you would have to transform the configuration from EH cache to Redis then. Yeah. OK, yeah. thank you. All right. So I would say thank you very much. Uh, see you later at the party, and have a great rest of the conference. Thanks. Thank you.